All right, so where we left off, we've been talking about gram staining, and there's two uh, different types of ways that we, or two different types of results that we can get from gram staining. So I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, I'll use blue for this. So if we do gram staining with one type of bacterium, we call these things gram positive. And what the result of this is, is we, you know, we have some crystal violet, I mean, I guess I'll, let me just uh, change this up here. So gram staining here, I have a crystal violet, I add that to the cell. I then add some iodine to act as a mordant. Um, and then rinse it off and then counter stain it with some molecules called safranin. Safranin is always used um, for counter stain purposes. So if a um, bacterial cell is gram positive, it really looks uh, purple, which I'm sure you can understand why, because it retains that crystal violet. Um, a gram-negative bacteria, on the other hand, though, looks a bit more red or pink um, in color due to the fact of the safranin. So let's just draw this here, and then the purple because of the crystal violet. I could probably switch colors to that, but I'm, yeah, okay, fine. Crystal violet. Uh, and the way that I remember this is the I in negative, and there's an I in pink, and the negative sign, we could turn that to its side to where it looks like an I. Yeah, I know, that's kind of lame, but... That's my motion of how I get things by. Okay, so um, there's two diagrams in here. Over here we have gram positive on this picture, and over here we have gram negative in this picture. And the reason why I really like this is because it shows the just how much difference there really is in these peptidoglycan uh, cell walls here as opposed to, uh, let me do it in green, this huge thick thing of peptidoglycan as opposed to with the gram negative, there's such a little amount there. But what is something that they both have? Well, they both have a uh, plasma membrane made out of a phospholipid bilayers with certain proteins inside of it. They both have a periplasmic space. Both gram positive and gram negative have that. Um, and they both uh, have some general structures of this peptidoglycan, but it's not so much. Um, they also have on the gram negative, there's a secondary membrane layer there called the outer membrane. It's made of a phospholipid bilayer as well. And then uh, on the outside here, I just want to draw your attention to these lipopolysaccharides. These are what help retain that safranin, one. And two, um, they act as bacterial endotoxins, uh, which we'll talk about later, and uh, trigger a really bad immune response or inflammatory response, not really bad, but they trigger an inflammatory response in the host cells that they're infected with. And these tend to be uh, acidophiles for the most part, um, but also just kind of something to think about. Uh, if I have this thick, thick uh, cell wall here of peptidoglycan, Am I going to be able to form a sex pelus if I have one of these? No, no, I don't. So the more of this thick protein we have here, the less likely we are to have a formation of a sex pelus. But by the same notion, if I have this outer membrane here, am I going to be able to form an endospore, which is something we'll talk about later, but they can't form an endospore because they have this outer layer here. So there's pros and cons of both uh, being, you know, either or. Also, gram-positive bacteria, because they have this protein here and then this periplasmic space. But this protein isn't uh, an amphipathic molecule. It's not polar and nonpolar, as opposed to this secondary outer membrane, which is. So because of this, it's a lot easier to get stuff to go into a gram-positive bacteria as opposed to a gram-negative bacteria. So gram-positive are less advanced structurally but they are more metabolically complex, whereas it's the exact opposite with gram-negative bacterium. So, pretty cool stuff there. All right, so let's talk about mycoplasmas. So, let's just say that this is a, well, you know what, we'll be, let's say that this is a cell in my intestine, and here's the villi for it, and here's the nucleus, and all the other stuff, and, and I am a mycoplasma. I am a eukaryotic cell parasite. So I'm living inside of a eukaryotic cell. They are very, very simple and they don't have a cell wall. So why would they not have a cell wall? Well, they're living inside a eukaryotic cell. The, the inner environment here is very, very constant. I'm going to just say K for that. It's a constant. The, the concentrations of uh, solutes inside a eukaryotic cell is constant. And if the cell wall provides to protect it from osmotic pressure, 
and it's constant, then having a cell wall there would be metabolically taxing, right? If you, you have it, but you don't use it, then what's the point of having it? So they don't have it. And this is really evolutionarily and biologically significant because it supports the simplified cell hypothesis that viruses were once living cells that got simplified down to the brass simplicity of all that they needed to survive of just a genome and protein and maybe a membrane or envelope, quote unquote, if it's necessary. So pretty interesting stuff there. Whoa, I think we went too fast. Okay, ATB, <laughs> ATB, ATP binding cassettes, otherwise called ABC transporters. Um, if you've ever looked into eukaryotic uh, ATB binding cassettes, these are completely different, um, very much different uh, from what you'd see in bacteria because they're very, well, I mean, they have some things in common. They're very specific receptors for transporting a specific substance uh, into, or substances, uh, into and out of the cell by hydrolyzing ATP. So, um, let's delete that. Each AT ABC transporter has a specific receptor for transporting a specific substance into and out of the cells by hydrolyzing ATP. I think that's a repeat from the last slide, but nevertheless, that's the main point that you want to drive home here. So here's a picture here. So this is the solute binding protein here that I'm going to go ahead and do this diagram in blue. Um, we have our solute binding protein here, and this has a very specific um, active site. Because remember, conformational change can happen with more than just enzymes for whatever nutrient molecule it needs. So say that something that this bacterial cell needs depending on its environment. We're not really worried about that. So it binds here. This binding here causes a conformational change, which causes it to bind to the hydrophilic channel subunits here, because they're in they're in integral membrane subunits that are bound to the membrane. And then this conformational change of this binding here. Is going to, and I'll do it in red, is going to cause uh, blue. the solute to be actively passed through here. Now, it's not going to be able to pass through here unless these subunits hydrolyze ATP and causes a, another conformational change. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with this concept of conformational change but it's really important in understanding how this process works. So as you know, these proteins don't just exist like this in the cell. They actually exist as these long, uh, drawn out, three-dimensional complexes here that um, look pretty much as random and as crazy as what I'm drawing here, and I'll do these in white. Okay, so once this binds here, and I, this is kind of getting a little bit messy, but I'm gonna switch to green. Once this binds here, we have a breaking and then reforming of our covalent bonds that design that molecule, that give the protein its three-dimensional shape. This causes a chain reaction of breaking and reforming, breaking and reforming of covalent bonds, not temporary changes, but, you know, uh, I'm sorry, not permanent changes, the changes are temporary. And this, through a series of changes, is what gives it to this state, okay? Uh, but we're not going to release our uh, substrate through this little channel here and into the cytoplasm unless we have the hydrolysis of ATP. What does the hydrolysis of ATP do? I'll just draw it over here. ATP goes in and then it's converted to ADP. Well, what really happens is it forms an aspartyl phosphate bond with one of the molecules inside here donating, that's what the difference between this, this has three molecules of phosphorus, this has two molecules of phosphorus, so it gives off one of its phosphorus molecules, forming an aspartyl phosphate bond with these subunits here. And what that does is, again, the breaking and reforming of covalent bonds, causing a change in the protein shape, and it's going to cause this, uh, whatever our nutrient is, to be pumped into the cytoplasm. So this is a form of active transport. And the reason why I absolutely despise and hate this textbook, this microbiology, I hit myself, uh, by Wiley, the reason why I hate this textbook and I hate this image is because it shows them, it doesn't show the change in conformation happening. It just shows them as a stable, you know, Stas static objects. That's not what's happening. It's, you know, constantly being changing its shape and changing its structure and changing its function. And these uh, phospholipid uh, uh, molecules that I think I lost my pen there. Okay, here we go. Are moving back and forth. And these are actually bobbing up and down and spinning like a top. It's a, just a lot more complex than it needs to be. And I just think that's something that they should include. Okay. 
my little rant <laughs> aside, let's talk about the signal peptide. So if you remember when we were in just general biology, we talked about the signal recognition particle uh, of how, um, you know, and a protein is going to be excreted out of the cell and it gets threaded through the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Well, this process here, and I don't know if I brought a picture with it or not, of the signal peptide shows how that comes to be. Because remember, endosymbiotic theory and all the effects that it has that all the really eukaryotic cells are is prokaryotic cells that began phagocytizing um, and then developed aerobic metabolism. So this is used to export proteins uh, via specific tags. And then many of the type of sec proteins or secretatory proteins are arranged alphabetically. So let's just see. Uh, oh, I guess I didn't include a picture with it. Sad. We'll just keep that in mind. I guess I could just draw it here. It's not too too hard of a picture to show. Here's our cell. Um, here's our ribosomal subunit. That's our messenger RNA. And then this is the polysome. And it has a, I'll do it in red, tag here that says, hey, I want you to excrete me. And then here's a protein here. And then uh, some type of a recognition molecule will, or protein is going to bind to this and it's going to take it through here and then the rest of the protein will be threaded out of the cell. So that's a precursor. The reason why I'm including it is that it's a precursor to the signal recognition particle. Okay, so kind of taking a secondary look at gram-negative uh, bacteria. Remember, they have an inner membrane, a very, very thin cell wall, and then they have an outer membrane. These are phospholipids. I'm just not drawing all the little fatty acid tails there. And the lipopolysaccharides. That's not really superbly important. Um, but remember that this is the, this is made up of both a polar uh, head and then a nonpolar tail. So if everything, like say water, okay, water's polar, or glucose is polar. How would you get something through a barrier that is both polar and nonpolar when molecules can only be polar and nonpolar? So this is what they, we need uh, these porin molecules for. Okay, these are dumb, and by dumb I mean broad, nonspecific channels that will allow anything small and anything polar enough to get through. So I guess I'll do my porin in green. Uh, here. Anything small and polar to passively diffuse into the cell. Uh, glucose, amino acids, etc. But this is really interesting because mutated forms of these uh, inhibit antibiotics from being able to enter the cell. It's a highly selective process. Okay, another example would be the Ton B dependent receptors. These actively transport specific scarce nutrients into the periplasmic space, such as like vitamin B12 or iron, and then through a secondary protein set into the bacterial membrane and into the bacterial cell. So here's these two pictures here that I have. Um, use red, or you know, we'll go with green. Okay, so porins, this is broad in its means. This ton B over here is very specific. in its action. So porin trimer, tri meaning three, mer meaning uh, molecules or parts, um, if you want to get specific here. So it's made up of three different protein sets. But I would say a porin trimer. So let's just say, uh, I don't know, glucose. Glucose is just, just an example of something that's small and polar. So it's going to go through here and into the periplasmic space of the gram-negative bacteria. Remember, we're all talking about gram-negative here, okay? 